just shop the perimeter of the grocery store. And that isn't perfect by any means, but you're going to reduce about 90% of all ultra processed foods. And you're really just going to stick to whole foods that we could find in nature, plants and animals. Welcome to the Carnivore Revolution. I'm Serena. And today with me, I have Craig McCloskey. He's a certified health coach who has a bachelor's of science degree in nutrition and dietetics with an extensive background in research and biochemistry. Craig has worked with thousands of individuals to help them reverse chronic diseases and improve their health through natural and lifestyle intervention. So thank you for being here, Craig. I'm excited to talk to you about things other than carnivore stuff, because usually I only talk to carnivore people. No, thank you for having me. I'm excited to, to talk to your audience and uh, about things that I love. Yeah, so um, so today we're going to touch on other things besides the carnivore diet. I just wanted to touch on other natural ways of healing for people because so many people are kind of turned off by the carnivore diet because it's just meat, which I actually love the carnivore diet and love the way I get to eat. But a lot of people just think that's ridiculous. And so um, if you could just start with your story and then we'll kind of dive into um, how we can heal people with all different kinds of natural eating. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I love the carnivore, carnivore diet myself. I've tried it uh, on and off. I use it as a tool um, on and off, like occasionally. Um, but I mean, it can be healing for so many people. My personal story, I mean, kind of like, like most individuals in the health field, kind of start because I've had poor health myself growing up eating a standard American diet, um, just growing up in that environment, eating a ton of fast food as a kid. And uh, you know, when I was a teenager, I was an athlete growing up and, and doing all the things, but um, where my health journey really started and I really started to take this as a profession was in college. And I was a college athlete and I really understood that nutrition impacted my performance, but no more than that. Macros and carbs and all this sort of stuff that were taught in kind of the mainstream. So because of that, I decided to major in nutrition at, at Penn State. And my sophomore year is when I really kind of just, my world got flipped upside down. My uncle, who at the time was 43, he went to bed one night and he just didn't wake up the next morning. And essentially he died from a massive heart attack. And like I said, he was 43, so super young. And he had a couple young kids at the time. And at that time, I was a sophomore in college, and I was majoring in nutrition, minoring in kinesiology. And that really kind of just set me back and started, I really wanted to take this as a profession because of, because of that instance, because of my uncle. And so that led to me doing research outside of my university. And as we all know, and your audience probably knows, I mean, universities don't teach the things that maybe, it, it's very controversial for sure, but it just, Penn State didn't teach me the, the things that I learned elsewhere. And they definitely didn't recommend a carnivore diet or heavy meat consumption. They actually, you know, talked about the opposite. So uh, I say all that to say that I really started to delve into podcasts and read a ton of books outside of my university coursework. And that was in 2015 when, when my uncle passed away. So it's been about eight years now that I've really just kind of immersed myself into this field of trying virtually uh, everything that I could get my hands on, trying different diets, reading books from both ends of the spectrum, from vegan to carnivore and kind of everywhere in between, paleo, ancestral. And where I've kind of really fallen into is really just a simple approach to, to health and wellness is just eating a local diet with whatever's like local to me and whatever's local to you and knowing how to traditionally prepare your foods and, and just encompassing more aspects than just nutrition, stress and uh, exercise and toxins and all that stuff. So that's kind of where I'm at today. So how do you balance um, when you go out to eat or when you're out with friends or you're at a party? How do you balance that with um, your nutrition that you follow? Do you stick with it all the time? I'm pretty, I'm 95% of the time. And it's very difficult sometimes because I, I tend not to go out to eat that much. And because of the environment that I live in and the community that I'm surrounded in right now, it's easy that when I do go out to eat, the people that I go out to eat with are like-minded. So it's not as weird at, to, to order something that doesn't have seed oils in it, or I ask for whatever without dressing or, you know, ask for the steaks not to be cooked on anything. So, so that helps. But when I go back to visit family in Pennsylvania, 
it's a little more challenging because they're still using all the stuff that I grew up on, right? And so that makes it a little bit more challenging, but uh, through working with them, they're very understanding of my dietary request. So uh, now it's kind of second nature. I just kind of find, navigate my way through their fridge and I bring stuff myself, I bring my own foods. So I'd say 95% of the time, I'm pretty strict, I'm pretty regimented with my own dietary approach. And it doesn't have to be complicated, right? Like I get a lot of questions and I'm sure you do too. Like, how do I get started? People will say, and what do you tell people who ask that? Yeah, I, I think it's really just about starting local. And, and for me, that was kind of the simplest advice that I could give people and helping them to understand. I mean, we have access to grocery stores where there's foods imported from all over the world. And most people get their, their, their foods from the grocery store. And so just from like a basic standpoint, I would suggest just shop the perimeter of the grocery store. And that isn't perfect by any means, but you're gonna reduce about 90% of all ultra processed foods. And you're really just gonna stick to whole foods that we could find in nature, plants and animals. But then we can get more kind of specific from there if people are dealing with autoimmunity. But typically my, my first suggestion is shop the perimeter of the grocery store, but even better is start looking up for like local farms and just kind of find uh, farms near you or a farmer's market and shop there. And then if when you're getting better at this and you're getting more excited about your new dietary approach, I would, you know, just find what works for you. So that's what would be my number one piece of advice. And let's talk about protein because there is all kind of conflicting information about protein mm -hmm. and how much we actually need. And I know people who eat, you know, 30 grams of protein a day, women who are you know, bigger than me, maybe um, younger than me, taller than me, but women who eat a fraction of the amount of protein mm. that I eat every day. And so what are your thoughts on protein and the, the guidelines versus what we should be eating? Yeah, I, I, I believe that most people are just barely meeting the recommended amounts by the guidelines. And the guideline recommendations are, in my opinion, and in many others' opinions, uh, drastically too low. And Right now, I believe it's 0.36 grams per pound of body weight per day. And that's that's a really low amount. I'm, you know, off the top of my head, I'm not sure how much meat that would be, but it's not, it's not a ton of, of grams per day. So what uh, I typically would suggest is more about one gram per pound of body weight per day. And and that for the easy breakdown, um, as a 180 pound male that's six foot one, uh, that's 180 grams of, of protein per day. And that can fluctuate. This is my, my opinion, my recommendation, but this could fluctuate, you know, through depending on how active I am, if I'm trying to put on muscle or put on weight or, or lose weight, but typically that's what I would recommend. And most people aren't coming anywhere near that. I mean, you kind of said like 30 some grams per day is like what people might be eating. And this is difficult because a lot of people are tending to fill up on maybe carbohydrate rich foods, and maybe they don't eat protein in the morning. I'm a big fan of if you're not intermittent fasting, which there's benefits there. But if you eat a protein rich breakfast, uh, you know, fill it up with with a bunch of protein that you know, because that'll keep you satiated throughout the day. So I'm a fan of aiming for that one gram per pound of protein per body weight per day. So um, easy suggestion there if you're 130 pounds, eat 130 grams of protein. But if you're maybe 250 pounds and your ideal body weight is maybe 150, eat 150 grams of protein per day. And that can easily be done on carnivore diet or an animal-based diet, or even just including more animal-rich foods into your diet. Yeah. So the guidelines are barely enough for somebody to like maintain their muscle mass, much less to build muscle mass. They're there to basically prevent deficiency or muscle loss. And it's not a, I mean, it's not the amount needed to produce great health. It's just there to prevent basically deficiencies. So we don't wanna just survive. We wanna actually be able to thrive and, and be the best versions of ourselves. So I wouldn't recommend eating the, the baseline level of, of protein recommended by the guidelines. And so what about exercise? What are your best recommendations for people as far as exercise goes? Yeah, um, the first thing is, is do something you love because that's probably what you'll, you'll stick to. But also, I mean, there's so we know the research is is so full of benefits of doing strength training and just incorporating some form of strength training exercise 
the research is strong on doing hit training. So like sprints or kind of short bursts, get your heart rate up really fast and kind of bring it down and, and do that again. And the research is strong on just walking. So typically what I recommend is following, you know, just every single day, just walking and moving slow throughout the day, just long walks and prioritizing that. But then like a few times a week, it doesn't have to be extremely heavy if, if somebody is just starting out, but do like maybe three to four days a week of, of weight bearing activities. It can be resistance bands. It can be, uh, you know, just deadlifts or, or squats. I encourage all of it. And then of course, some form of sprinting. And hopefully you fall in love with this process because there's so many benefits to it, but do something you love first and foremost. But I, I you know, I suggest doing a little bit of everything if you can. And what about biohacking? Do you do any kind of biohacking and do you recommend that to other people? Yeah, this has kind of evolved for me over the years. Uh, I definitely got introduced to Dave Asprey, who kind of is the, the thought leader in, in the biohacking space back in late 2015, early 2016, kind of in my search for trying to understand everything. And I started doing the Bulletproof Coffee and trying everything that he was recommending. And then that led me to getting, you know, making friends with a bunch of other people. So uh, I, I do, I try to source like the real things first, because I think biohacks are more to kind of hack, you know, kind of like uh, supplement your things that, that you could just find in nature. So one instance is I like to get out in earth and ground and connect my bare feet to the grass. Uh, a biohack, I guess you could say, is using maybe like earthing technology, kind of like what I'm using here to keep myself grounded, connected to the earth even though I'm not outside right now. So in that instance, yeah, I would say I do a little bit of biohacking. You could say sauna or like cold plunging or things that hack your biology to give you that one leg up on kind of the competition or just like improve yourself as much as possible. But really my, my, my foundation is really just doing things that our biology has an ancestral intelligence with. So that's getting cold and, and going in saunas. And we have these things now, but throughout human history, our ancestors had no choice, but we didn't have air conditioning all the time. We didn't have, you know, so it's just uh, things like that. We call them biohacks now, but it's really just kind of doing things in today's modern world that really are able to just make our biology the best that it, that it can be. So, so I do, I guess, do biohack. You mentioned fasting before. So what do you think about fasting? And do you fast on a regular basis, extended, intermittent fasting? What do you think? I do. Uh, I'm a big fan of it. And I, especially in, in today's world, uh, most people are, uh, we, they have excess calories on their body that need burned. And to burn those calories, you need to be in a uh, kind of starvation state. And I'm a big fan of intermittent fasting, whether that's in the morning or just having a condensed eating window, I think can be very beneficial. And it doesn't need to be anything crazy. Uh, kind of like a 12 and 12, I think is a great start. And that's as simple as stop eating at eight o'clock at night and just start eating again at eight o'clock in the morning. And I think 99% of people can say, oh, I can do that. Right. But then when you start to extend it out to maybe 16 hours fasted, that's maybe 10 o'clock in the morning, you stop eating at six at night. And then you start eating again at 10 o'clock in the morning. I think a majority of people could also kind of get on board with that. And that's where I started because I saw immense benefits from that just kind of leaning out and more energy. I kind of got away from those cravings and I became a more fat adapted individual learning how to use my body fat as fuel and really improving my metabolism. And I think a lot of people, even women included, because I think there's a lot of kind of information out there that says women shouldn't fast pretty much no matter what, but I think it just comes down to the individual and how they do it and how long they do it for, because I, I think there's a lot of benefit to, you know, not eating all the time because we're not herbivores. We're not ruminants. We're not designed to graze, you know, we're hunter gatherers and we are designed to feast and famine, if that makes sense. And what's your thought process on how much food you should eat during your eating window? Or like, for instance, if you did a, a 48 hour fast, how much food should you eat on that refeed day? There's a lot of people who, um, myself included in the beginning of carnivore, I was fasting a lot. And then I wasn't eating enough in my eating windows and my body just kind of shut down and I went into starvation mode. I actually gained weight like that. Yeah, that was something that was tricky for me as well, because uh, I would sometimes I got so just satiated from either just like a, a fatty cup of coffee, having like a creamer in there or, or really not eating at all. 
I would go to maybe two or three in the afternoon and just not even think about eating because I was so full and I, you know, I just was really well adapted. But again, that kind of put my body in a stressed out state, kind of like you were saying. And that, you know, was a, something I needed to play around with, but it is difficult sometimes to also eat enough in that specific eating window. Uh, because if you're condensing your eating window to six hours or four hours, how do you fit, you know, 2000 calories in there, give or take with enough protein, because protein is very satiating. It's tough to eat 50 to hundred grams of protein and maybe a sitting and then, you know, turn around and eat it again a few hours later. So, and also meet all your micronutrient needs and everything like that. So uh, if that is an issue, I mean, you don't necessarily need to intermittent fast. I would maybe do two meals, uh, smaller portion meals or three meals throughout the day, just full of protein. And that's kind of where I'm at now. I have days where I intermittent fast, but I've currently been loving just like dairy in the morning, whether that's yogurt or kefir or, or raw milk. I, I love to have that at like nine or 10 o'clock in the morning. And, you know, I eat maybe two or three times throughout the day, just meeting my protein needs. So that's something that has helped me, especially with uh, my increased uh, exercise, my activity needs. But that is something that uh, has definitely helped me and could help others. What is the worst culprit in our standard American diet? Do you think that is causing so many sicknesses? Mm. Uh, over the years, I've definitely said it was sugar, uh, processed sugar, but lately I've been pretty much convinced that it's seed oils. I mean, they just, it's, it's a lot harder for our, we have a, a pretty, when we ingest sugars, processed sugars, corn syrup, we can eliminate those pretty easily. I want to say like we, we are, we spike our blood sugar, but we can burn that as fuel seed oils they incorporate themselves into our fat tissues, into our cells, into our, our membranes. So linoleic acid, one of the fatty acids in vegetable oils, in seed oils, that stays in our bodies for 680 days is the half-life of linoleic acid. And so if you're somebody like me that was growing up on seed oils, it could take you a couple years to eliminate that linoleic acid from your cells. So that's, that's not to say to discourage anyone, but it just really makes you think about the types of fats that you eat because they are very, uh, they're pretty problematic for a variety of reasons, that's particularly linoleic acid because of it breaks down into a lot of volatile compounds. 4-HNE is one, uh, and it just has been shown to be not only associated, but causal in several uh, major diseases, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and obesity and diabetes and, and many major issues like that. It's, it's, I would just, uh, if you can eliminate seed oils, you pretty much eliminate 90 to 95% of the things in the center aisles of the grocery store. That's why I recommend going around the, the perimeter of the grocery store because you're eliminating vegetable oils, added sugars and refined grains. Those three together are a pretty, pretty deadly combination. Now, you guys, I know that Craig is not carnivore, so what you're about to hear is not carnivore, and it's fine. We're all on the same page. Keto, carnivore, ancestral, paleo, we are all just really trying to help people to heal. And if you need to hear about ancestral so that you will start healing your body and give up the processed foods and the seed oils and things like that, then I am all about that. So I want to hear what a typical day of eating looks like for you, mm. Craig. Yeah, like I said, I've kind of I, I kind of venture in and out of different phases depending on where what my goals are at that particular time. But right now, where I'm at, uh, I wake up and I have water, um, you know, spring water or reverse osmosis water. Sometimes I'll add a little bit of lemon in there, and uh, then maybe about an hour after I wake up, I do have coffee. Um, it's a, it's a high quality, organic, mold free coffee. I, I kind of a coffee snob. I just love the ritual of it. Um, but I do like to cycle through going on and off my coffee because it is a drug and caffeine is, is pretty addictive. So, and it's, you know, just be mindful of that, but then, uh, maybe around 10 o'clock and this varies depending on the day. Uh, I like to have, start my day with yogurt. It's a, it's a nice yogurt bowl that I've been having for probably about a year and a half now, but it's, it's a nice farm fresh yogurt that I'll get from my local farm. And then I'll add, uh, blueberries to it. I'll add honey or maple syrup to it. And that's pretty much it, honestly. Sometimes I'll add like a sprouted nut butter, but that's on a rare occasion because nuts, nuts butter in particular can be very easy to overeat and it's full of omega-6s. And if they're not properly prepared, they can be 
Um, you know, they can contain oxalates and a lot of other anti-nutrients. So that's something to be mindful of. So that's typically breakfast. And then maybe that fills me up for maybe a couple hours. And then by lunchtime, I love to have my meat for the first time. Uh, so I'll have maybe eggs or, or steak or ground beef with uh, cheese on top. So like I'll make burgers. And then I'll also have usually like a side of maybe avocado or sauerkraut or something like that on the side. And that's, that's pretty much lunch. I mean, that's also probably 50 to maybe 80 grams of protein right there. So right there, I probably had maybe 120, 110, 120 grams of protein between the dairy and the, the meats by lunchtime. So then that fills me up until dinner. And then usually I'm smoking some sort of steak or, or cooking burgers or it's pretty basic. I mean, my, my diet is pretty boring because it's always the same stuff, but that's kind of what I recommend. And, you know, it's very nutritious food, but uh, typically my dinners are some form of, of beef five days out of the week. Sometimes I'll include a little bit of fish, but not regularly. And then maybe a chicken dish once every other week or so, but typically it's beef, burgers, steak, or something like that, um, that I, you know, prepare a variety of different ways. And that's how I usually, I mean, I meet my protein needs, fat needs, and then depending on my activity that day, I'm increasing maybe my honey or maple syrup, uh, depending on how active I was that day. But that's a typical day for eating of me for me. Well, that seems like a really good place to wrap it up. I appreciate you joining me and hanging out, Craig, and talking about all these things. I think we just need, keep needing to spread the message about how to get healthier. And the way that we do that is by going back to our roots and eating just natural one ingredient foods. That's, you said it best. I couldn't agree more. Thank you so much. And thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time here on the Carnival Revolution.